Buenos días, amigos. Bien. Good morning, my friends, and welcome to this 26th event. These are going to be three days that hopefully will be a lot of fun for you. I wanted to start by telling you that this is a very special event because very rarely in our history there has been the following co coincidence. We are releasing a version, in this case, the Genexus 15, and we are holding the event at the same time. Usually these two things happen separately, but now they coincide. So many of the topics of this event would turn around the Genexus 15. But I didn't want to start speaking specifically about this version but rather I wanted to tell you about the things we've been working on as a company, firstly, what we have been doing as a company and which way we're going. And for this purpose, one of the interesting points is the following. We live in a very sophisticated world. A new version is just a little part of what we have to do. We have to do a lot around this version so that it is successful in the market. So firstly, we worked on the go-to market. What were the things that we had to do around the version so that when we went to the market with the version, it would be successful. The first thing we worked on was the process the process through which we released the version. We made a radical change last year, and this change actually started last year. We released updates every two months. We are on the sixth upgrade, and these releases are happening constantly. And also, we have night builds, so that at the end of the two months, if any client needs to download these bills, they will be able to do it. And this was a significant change for us. The other day I was saying, for me personally, it was the easiest or the most released uh, release of a version we had. For us, releasing a version was always traumatic, sleep at night, and weekends and things that are left for the last minute. But this time, releasing the version was just one more point in the process. One day we said, well, the version is released, it's closed, and it's been closed now for three weeks. So it was a substantial change, and we would like to work along this line in the future. What we will have to do is to upgrade every two months, as we've been doing. And secondly, we have been working on training. What we want is to strongly increase the number of people who are trained to use GenAxis. In fact, if you look at the figures, at the moment we have more than 200 academic partners in more than 28, in 28 countries in the world. That is to say, in 28 countries, GenAxis is used regularly. Also, we have certified more than 1,500 people this year. And besides, we are doing other things that are more experimental and uh, fun. For example, we are working with GUTIC, which is the Technology Chamber of Uruguay, and the CEIBAL Plan of Uruguay, which gives one laptop to each child. And we want to train young people to work in IT or in information. This is an aggressive plan. It targets 4,000 people. We want some people to be trained in GenXus, so we are trying different things. Usually what we do, we try something in Uruguay, and if it works, then we try to replicate it elsewhere, in other countries where we are present. And the last thing we are working on is documentation. With regard to documentation, the change is mostly cultural. And it comes from the origin of documentation, not our documentation, but the head of war. All IT people have the trend of documenting what we have done, but very rarely we say why we've done it, what things are for. So if you look at uh, people who have said what documentation is for. That's what they did. They did, well, this is what it's for. So in GenExus, the first thing we are doing is to establish the scenario, the people we are targeting, targeting whose life we are making easier. 
and this is the basis of our documentation. So from the beginning of the 15th version, we have established the idea that documentation has to start with a scenario to explain what the version is for. Of course, in the GeneXus, we have a lot of documentation so far. This is start, uh, so this is only a starting point. But in the future, we will be explaining what things are for and not only how they are used. So finally, we are trying to work on discovery. We have people who download the trial version every day throughout the world. And we want these people to have the capacity to download the version and do something. For example, to have a KB as an example. And at the same time, that they have a mini course where they can find the basic concepts of the version. So this is what we've been doing with regard to documentation. We were lucky because the GeneXus community helped us. And what I want to do now is to introduce the book written by Professor Douglas Oliveira from Brazil about user controls. We have the capacity of extending GeneXus from version 10. And this has been the case for a while, but we ne had never written how to do it. The documentation said more or less, do it as I do it. But Professor Douglas Oliveira was kind enough to write a book to help people who want to develop user control. And this is something that is going to come up several days several times these days because user experience is very important. And this is a book that is already available in Amazon. We also made significant changes in our distribution chain. Not only in-depth changes, but also we tried to cover more countries. So we opened a new office in the US, and we think it's a time to relaunch our presence in the United States. This is necessary, and I will shortly explain the reasons why we think that this is the moment to have a strong presence in the US. So we opened a new office, we now have new distributors, and we also have new distributors in Guatemala, Peru, China, and Australia. Finally, and uh, to end with uh, what I want to tell you about the company, for us the most important com component is the community. We have about 120,000 members in the GeneXus community, an interesting figure, but we have also been working on new kinds of members, in particular the students in the first place. We want to be very close to the students and what we did was to write a specific version, GeneXus for students, and to run specific events in Uruguay, uh, an event called Desprogramate, Deprogram Yourself, uh, an event which was specific for students. And with CUTI, uh, the Technology Institute and the Saibal laptop plan, this is something that interests us a lot. And finally, the entrepreneurs. What we want is to have entrepreneurs that use GeneXus in order to develop their stats apps or for other purposes. A couple of years ago, we created the Talis Lab in GeneXus, which helps startups and corporate entrepreneurs so that they can push ahead their plans. Uh, Talis Lab was a startup, but we wanted to see which values we could contribute. So now we are in the second uh, generation of Talis Labs and spin offs. So now we can proceed to the following stage. So with regard to Talis Lab, I wanted to say that now we are on a new stage and we are opening it to the whole community. So far, we wanted to do it as a test in Uruguay, but now we are ready to receive startups from anywhere in the world, startups and corporate enterprises. 
or new enterprises. So we want to do it like this, and we are so lucky that the Inter-American Development Bank is helping us uh, in this project. So now I wanted to invite Ana Castillo from the Inter-American Development Bank to come to the stage and tell us how they're helping us. Hello, Ana. How are you? What are you doing today for us? I know that you are doing a lot. Can you tell us something in this regard? This is going to be an intimate talk. Yes, indeed, only 1,600 people. Everybody knows the IDB, but you are working for the Multilateral Investment Fund inside the IDB. The MIF has been working for more than 20 years. It helps the private sector. And in Uruguay, we have been helping the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Fine. How can you help us? Or how? what could you do for us? Well, it's good to know uh, why we are working for Sales Lab. Yes, that's fine. I don't need to ask you the questions. It is interesting indeed. Firstly, because without any doubt, one of the areas in which we focus, which is related to the economy of knowledge, is the promotion of quality jobs linked to the growth of IT companies. So it's very much related to what you want to do. On the other hand, because of the technological know-how of GenXus and Talis Lab as partners, we are interested, and also you are an entrepreneur. This is a very important asset. Yes, it's in our blood. Indeed, it's very important for a company and for the society as a whole. And here you have the huge community of developers, which is also very significant. You have contacts at a local and international level, and you have this double approach. Firstly, to work with startups, and secondly, the digital transformation of existing companies. Therefore, we believe that we can have an excellent partnership. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much for being here and for your words. So, as I said, in order to have a successful version, you have to do a lot of things beforehand. And another one of the points which is very relevant, in my opinion, is try to understand the context in which a version is going to move. We release the version today, but what's going to happen? What is the world in which it's going to be used? So now I wanted to tell you a bit about the context. What is happening, in my opinion? What's going on? or where the bullets come from, I would say. So I want to tell you about the current situation. I think that this situation is misleading. If we look at one side of the coin, things seem to be very calm and nothing much is happening. But if we flip the coin, we see a lot of things going on. So. This could, as I said, mislead us. What do I mean? From the technological point of view, about three, four years ago, we insisted that a modern system had to have three components, mobile, native applications, web applications, especially responsive applications, and then a component that is hosted in the cloud. These three things were the ones we started mentioning three years ago as the focus of our work. And in 2015, 2016, we saw that nothing much had happened. If you take the apps, for example, what's new? Well, we have the Android 7, the iOS 10, the new versions of operative systems. But these are incremental improvements not many changes. With regard to the web, some frameworks were released. But what the users want is a responsive application that can be seen in a PC, in an iPad, or in a phone. So no big changes there. With regard to the cloud, instead, there are interesting changes going on. Cloud started with infrastructure, infrastructure as a service. And now it's moving towards platform, platforms as services. And this is a 
significant change that we have been accompanying and we have been releasing GeneXus characteristics so that they can be used more and more. But things seem quite stable without very big changes. It would seem that we can say, well, we can relax, there's nothing much going on. But if we flip the coin, we see that a lot is happening. And what do I mean by the other side of the coin? I think that this was symbolized by Mark Anderson with this phrase, software is eating the world. I am a bit less aggressive. I say that the software, the software is invading the world, but this is the main concept. And what do we mean by this? Every time we touch a company with a software, there is a change that will last forever. And the pattern that is followed is always the same. At the beginning, software is used to do the same thing we used to do, but in a more efficient manner. And throughout time, we start realizing that with the software, we can do what was impossible in the past. So we start by doing things more efficiently, and we end up doing things that were impossible to do in the past. Firstly, we work to achieve efficiently and then we target efficacy and these are substantial changes and the players in this industry are therefore subject to an enormous set of changes. Uh, I took one industry as an example, could have taken many, but I took the automotive industry because I've always liked it. Let's say that you manufacture cars and a car is subject at the moment to three change factors, which are substantial and important, and all three have to be taken care of. Firstly, that started with the Tesla, is the transition of combustion uh, mo uh, motors to electrical motors. Now, if you have a combustion car, we are going to feel that we are attacking the planet or something like that. So there is a general movement after Tesla was successful in that direction. Tesla was the first automotive company to be successful since Toyota after the Second World War. Why? Because they manufactured a motor that was 100% electric. The second factor for change is self-driving cars. You see here a Volvo, an actual Volvo, it's not a drawing, a Volvo that, uh, it's, uh, that drives by itself. And uh, as you will see, these transitions take a long time. Uh, this person is not driving, but I don't know whether you can see what he's doing. He's reading a book. I don't think that Volvo has uh, finished understanding the transition yet, because I would have put an iPad and on a book. But I told Milano, and Milano said, oh, you're wrong. What I want to show is that the book appears in the windshield later, and this is what's going to happen in the future, what we'll be seeing more and more. Well, you may tell me, ah, he's speaking about science fiction, we'll never see it. But the other day, Victor Villar, who was in Las Vegas, told me that he got very scared because he was walking, stopped at a light, and then he saw a car coming and stopped. But there was no one inside the car when he looked. The car was empty. The t light turned green and the car left. So we are going to see these kind of things more and more. They are much closer than we would imagine. Last year I talked about Uber and in, I had to explain what Uber was. And well, you see, this thing is happening also with cars. Cars that are self-driving are interesting because last week the US government announced regulations for these cars. And I was very stricken by these regulations because I'd never seen regulations like this. And I think that these are the right guidelines that we should have in front of these new events. See what, what the regulations say at the beginnings beginning. We want to have cars that are self-driven because we believe that the highways are going to be safer. I, I've never seen lawyers uh, say we believe and we want 
But I think that they're right in saying so. And then they add, in these regulations, there are going to be things that are left ambiguous on purpose because they have not been covered by the technology yet. So the regulation has to evolve at the same time as the technology of the technologies until they reach a certain point. You cannot define the regulations and then the technological progress. Usually, it functions the other way around, and they should happen in parallel, hopefully, one evolves with the other. So this is the second topic. But there is another change factor which is much more subtle and is not associated to a technology. But it's still a substantial change. If Uber has become more and more universal and taxis improve because of Uber as well as public transport and cars are self-driven and renting a car has become much easier. Someone at some point will say, why do I want a car? Why do I need to own a car? So actually the big change in the automotive industry is that they are going through uh, towards a model of transport as a service to show you the vertigo of these things. Last year, the founder of Lyft, which is one of Uber's competitors, published an article which was widely uh, read, saying that by 2025, no one owned a car. I never believe will own a car. I never believe these things. I think that what he wanted to say, my company buy is uh, worth a lot, come and buy it whenever you want. But see what he's saying. So there is an underlying issue in here. When I told this uh, story to Marco Crispino, one of the guys from my development team, one of my friends, he said, well, I've been counting on an Excel spreadsheet uh, and uh, the figures I get are half of what they say. If things continue improving, transport as a service will cost half of owning a car. Marco can share the spreadsheet with you if you wish. So these three things are happening in the automotive industry at the moment. But I take any industry and I see that similar things are going on. The point is what to do. How do we react? in front of all of these new events. And I think that now we have a context in which we have to act. And the context can be described by two words, which I think you are going to be seeing everywhere from now on, digital transformation. What we have to do, each one of the companies in the world at the moment, is to have a digital life. Most companies are good throughout their physical life, but now they also need to have a digital life, and this is extremely important. We are going to be working, all of us, and from now on, on digital transformation. The GeneXus community is going to help all of our clients to achieve digital transformation. Therefore, this is the job we are going to have from now on. So what I want to tell you today is that the GeneXus event is, in my opinion, an, an event that has two important characteristics. Firstly, the community that gets together, the people we meet, and then the content that we come here to learn. I would like you to be able to say at the end of this event that you have a good idea about two things, two questions you might ask around digital transformation, what we have to do and how we have to do it. This is what I would like to answer during these three days. So I'm not going to start replying to both questions, otherwise uh, the event will be over in uh, one hour. But I will give you a general idea of what I think. Firstly, what to do. I think that every time we have to achieve a transformation, one of the important components is to imagine which way we want to go, where we want to be. And this is the reason why the motto of this event is Dream Digital. Because we have to start dreaming in this manner. We have to dream the digital world and our present in that digital world. 
So the point is that sometimes dream may be a very big word. What are we going to dream? Someone from my generation may dream of something supersonic. Another generation may dream of something else. But an imaginary world may be too far away. So I think that actually we have to work on more concrete dreams. In particular, I think that we have to dream on the digital assets that we have in each one of our companies. We are very used to having a strict control of physical assets. We know how much money the company has, how many machines, how many um, real estate, but we are not very clear about our digital assets and how to exploit them. You could tell me, well, define the digital asset. What, uh, asset, what does that mean? I, I have trouble usually defining things. So instead of defining academically what a digital asset is, I would like to invite Marcelo Pese from the judiciary of Uruguay to tell you a bit about what a digital asset is. Hello, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm responsible for technology in the judiciary. Please tell me uh, what's the asset of the judiciary. Well, the most important one are the files, the judicial files. And uh, the, the, the status of each one of the files. That's uh, one of the most important assets. And... Uh, um, you've had that, yes, we've had it uh, forever. And that's one of the most valuable assets and one of the assets that we protect the most. Um, does that entail a revolution? What does it mean? Well, precisely what we've done was to launch an app so that it's not only people or professionals, uh, law professionals can uh, check uh, where their files are, but also subscribe to it. If you subscribed, Whenever there is an, a change in the status of your file, you will get a message in your app, free of charge, uh, to know which the new status is. So there is an evolution out and an evolution in. Why is it a revolution out? Well, because those who in the audience uh, have gone to a court in Uruguay, for instance, well, we were reasoning that out from the standpoint of a physical asset, as if you had money in the vault of a bank. And what you want to do is to protect it. But although the information is public, institutionally speaking, we didn't want to give it away that easily. Now, the fact that a professional, uh, without having to go to a court, can know that his or her file uh, that he or she is interested in, you know, any citizen who is interested in a certain file can be um, told about it. So it means that a lawyer doesn't have to go to a court to find out. No. Um, simply to give value to that uh, asset is that it's visible for everyone. That's, that's one of the points precisely. Digital assets are valuable when you expose them when you share them if you keep them it's worth nothing so what do lawyers say well funnily enough uh, they say that this has changed their lives and and this has changed our life as well uh, from the launching of this application we have um, made it very specifically for a segment uh, you know, operators of the judiciary or people who were interested in a certain um, um, issue there are 85,000 um, files, uh, and we have people uh, who are interested in that. And now we have 12,000 people who are auditors of their own files. So if they um, are interested in it, you know, they, uh, they know that, uh, well, they will get a message about that file. So the users are increasing the value of the digital app. So it's a virtuous circle. Right. And that transforms us and transforms ourselves to that digital transformation. And it's uh, paving the road for other transformations as well. So we have to see this step by step. And you're going to make uh, presentations next year. Thank you very much. Okay,
yo, yo le pedí a Marcelo que viniera porque para mí ese, ese es un claro ejemplo de lo que está pasando. Probablemente, y por razones de eficiencia, como les contaba al principio, los activos, los activos digitales ya están, ya existen en la empresa. Lo que pasa es que no hemos, no hemos sabido orientarlos. Una de las tareas fundamentales de la transformación digital es orientar esos activos digitales hacia dónde? Hacia nuestros usuarios, hacia nuestros clientes. Bueno, el otro tema que tenemos que, que, que ver, en, me parece interesante para saber qué tenemos que hacer en la transformación digital, es escuchar a las personas que ya que están más avanzadas que nosotros. Las personas que ya están haciendo o que ya vienen trabajando de hace bastante tiempo en el tema de la transformación digital. Para eso, digamos, eh, tuvimos la enorme suerte de que el ingeniero Carlos Clúa no, nos visitara. El ingeniero Carlos Clúa es responsable de la transformación digital del Banco Sabadell en España. El Banco Sabadell es el tercer banco de España, después Santander y BVA, tengo entendido. Y él ha liderado toda la transformación digital del banco, haciendo cosas bastante interesantes, como por ejemplo... En la... Por ejemplo, um, the launching in Mexico of um, year, year in this two things that we know, for instance, uh, things that they can do through software. After this keynote, we have a talk by uh, Carlos Clua. Uh, this is an important component of, uh, of, of, of this. Esa es la parte de la pregunta, digamos, qué hacer. También está la otra, ¿no? This is another thing that we have to do. And, uh, Uh, what we have to do is a rocket to the moon, but the question is how to do that and how, how to do it. Now, that is why we think that one of the things we have to do is to see people, um, to see uh, the people who have already done these things. And that's why we ask you that for Wednesday's afternoon talk, we have asked engineer Santiago Lange. He is the gold medal in uh, sailing in Rio. He is the sportsman with the largest number. Uh, so please tell us something. We asked him to tell us something about what's happening. And he said one of the things uh, that he does is that he controls, he controls the sail, he controls, but he cannot control, and, and he controls his boat, but he cannot control the wind. He cannot control the waves. So how can we train, how can we be trained to live in a world where what we control is very small? And that's a very important component. Now, another important component, and this is something that is taken me to uh, my presentation, is that in the Genexus community, we've got a tool, we've got an arm, a weapon to do this, how to transform um, digitally and how to help you transform this digitally. And that's what, why I would like to um, invite up front Gaston Milano to tell us about it. Buenos días, amigos. Es... Thank you. It's an honor to be here and we are extremely happy um, for being here and for um, having this new release of GenNexus. First of all, I would like to thank the hundreds of beta testers who have worked together with us, contributing with their ideas, their time and their work um, around this version to make it better. And also all our partners, partners who have not only devoted their time to this version, but um, I have also met many of them who have told me about their products, the products that they create, that they release in this event together with uh, version 15. And I think this is what makes GenNexus bigger as a platform. It's not only GenNexus uh, making a product and uh, offering services, but there is a group of partners making uh, products and services expanding the platform. So thank you all. In my short talk, I'm not going to be talking in detail about uh, GenXus version 15 uh, before this morning ends. Uh, we're going to go over the pillars of this version and during all the event, we are going to go deeper into each of these pillars. One of the things I wanted to do here was that, it, to, and to say here, is that in this digital transformation, there is one step previous to that, and that is to be digitally competent. What does that mean? Well, that means to uh, understand that before dreaming or at the same time, we have to have um, a certain number of tools at our disposal. And we believe that GenXus 15 will accompany this question of uh, being competent. I was thinking about the three most important things 
that I would recommend uh, to say, well, I'm competent digitally. Well, I would say that the first one is that there is no digital transformation, no digital dream, if I don't consider what the user experience is like. In any contact that I have with my clients is to have the best experience. That's the user's experience. And Nicolas was talking about the pillars to get there, and Marcelo was showing it in the judiciary, for instance. Um, sometimes a transformation starts with something very simple, uh, creating, for instance, a native app. Now, GenXus 15 allows you to create native apps with a large user experience from the standpoint of interaction, visual, and architecture of uh, information that allows us to put it in our app. I was quite close to one of the apps that was very successful. Uh, it was created with the Mexican League. It was created with GenXus uh, 15. I was quite close to that, uh, to, to Gonzalo, uh, who has been working on it. Last year, this app was uh, presented. It had one million users. It had highlight. It had been highlighted by Apple. But uh, the important thing is that that app continued being used. And Gonzalo told me yesterday that there are 3.2 million users. That means that um, that app is being used by users and by a large number of active users. Now, that type of app, well, you can just say, well, this is a user's app, uh, the user's uh, experience, but it means that the use of that app from the scalability standpoint and the architecture of what we have to have behind from what we see in a native app, GeneXus 15 is providing all that infrastructure automatically for any native app. I was quite close to the Mexican League, but in this event we are showing very many apps with a large users experience. Among the native apps, and perhaps the most important one, more important than the application itself, is the question of notifications. Sometimes um, you, you, you require a native app just for notifications. In the judiciary, for instance, one of the most important uh, components um, is notification. In the Mexican League, that's also an important uh, component. Gonzalo told me yesterday that they were selling uh, 15 million n n notifications or notices um, every weekend, and, and that's important in terms of scalability. So we've been working on that, but well, somebody can tell me, all right, native apps can only be used by recurrent users, that's wrong with the, the solution, and that's true. Uh, many times we have to work not only with the native app, or instead of, uh, we have to work with web apps for desktop or for mobile. I think that mobile is not an option. You have to do it. We have to move on to mobile. Perhaps the first option is web, then native, and then supplement it. And what I'm showing you here is just an images of a dog shop uh, selling uh, dog food. And uh, what they've done with the GeneXus 15 version is that we're going to be seeing many cases linked to this. You know, Federico Salomon's got a talk uh, precisely about all the progress made in the web area. Now, one of the interesting things in uh, users' experience is that we're always going to be in touch with our clients. And our clients are social networks. Many times we forget that our applications, even if they are business applications, um, they, uh, we have to have in mind what is our contact with uh, social networks. More and more we are looking into new formats to publish and to see that the experience in that uh, social network is better. Daniel Marino is also going to have a talk um, about having particular formats in the social networks. Of course, obviously, we need different types of interactions in each one of them. Uh, so I think that the user's experience is something that uh, we need to be digitally competent. The other thing has to do with security. We all know and we've all seen many events with security, with security problems, uh, unnecessary ones, I would say. What happens is that every minute that goes by, we are seeing about half a million attack attempts in the cyberspace. I've taken this uh, from uh, um, a strategist, um, most certainly this number 
has grown. So what we've done is a Genexus that creates apps, the, the safest apps possibly. Um, everything that has to do with security, we would download it for all uh, Genexus lines. And what we're trying to do, and what we've done with this, is to work together and proactively with the people who know the most about security. And in fact, I would like to thank uh, the Nexus Consulting people because they help us to be proactive in this area. And then the other point, which is important, uh, many people say, well, Genex, digital transformations come from or stem from uh, users' experience and you need security. But many times, transformations have to do with integration, who I must integrate with. If I'm going to transform digitally, I have to open my eyes wide, look around, and see what the platforms I have to integrate with are. And Genex of 16, on the one hand, is still working on uh, market standards. Uh, we work with um, uh, REST, with, uh, so with um, integration methodologies, and that has uh, evolved to what we have open API, that is descriptive um, app services that are describing themselves. And then with platforms such as SAP, uh, that is very important, where uh, we are making specific integrations, or K2B, uh, which is an RP that uh, comes from our heart, from the bottom of our heart, it's fully Genexus, and it integrates uh, almost naturally. Um, and then also other platforms. Uh, for instance, last year we presented um, Mercado Libre. That's a platform uh, of uh, e-commerce. When... Uh, uh, I was preparing my presentation and looking into these things. I was looking at cases, successful cases around this, and we're going to be looking at this during all the event. And that reminded me of something, and I was quite pleased with it, because Gustavo Carriquiri, when I start, when I joined Genexus, which was Artech at that time, I was very euphoric and very happy, as I'm now. And uh, he said, well, all right, that's all too fine, that's all too well, you are celebrating, you're happy, and that's all. But uh, our maximum happiness is when a client, when a customer um, uses Genexus and achieves something with Genexus. That's our maximum target. And that's the case of um, um, the SDK of uh, Mercado Libre. And the people from NetGate who were going to be making a talk yesterday used that integration to start transforming digitally. Um, uh, NetGab is a retailing uh, app and they were integrated with uh, Mercado Libre and they were doing this manually. Using uh, SDK, they went from uh, uh, being able to publish 350 products per uh, customer, which I believe was wonderful, to uh, publishing over 40,000 products. Now, obviously, there is no ceiling to it. There is no cap to it because it's aut fully automated. Many times, digital transformations start by integration instead of starting with an app. And this is what Genexus Skin 15 is going to help us in. If we are concerned about the user experience, our point of contact, we are uh, concerned that what we do is secured, and we open up the field and we look at who we have to integrate with, I think that we're going to be digitally competent and we'll be able to dream about the digital transformation. This is what I wanted to share with you. In, the, in terms of the late motif of this event, which is the digital transformation. We are leading to Nexus 15, and many people in our development team vibrate to make things simple. And we want to increase our productivity in each one of our versions. And I think that productivity, incremental development, um, I think that in this version we are in a point of no return with a feature that increases productivity and incremental development to other levels and we're going to continue working on that. I wanted to share with you a video of these characteristics um, which is fundamental and, uh, and, and in that way we're going to release Genexus 15. Desde el principio de los tiempos. Right from the beginning of our times, it doesn't matter what art we are talking about, 
A creator always needs to feel his art. If it's a sculpture, it has to touch it. If it's a paint, it has to see it. If it's a painter, it has to see it. If it's a musician, it has to listen to it. However, when you create apps, there is a large distance between the way we work and the results we obtain. In fact, if we create apps, some of us, we think about design, others think about codes, and others think about abstractions purely. Now, what happens is that the digital world is, is uh, resetting itself. The feeling of the passage of time is different, and we work in the world of ideas and bits. An application is a very specific time where user is interacting, and so we ask ourselves, what would happen if we could feel our application while we are creating it? What would it, what would it be like if we could touch it? Why can't we mold it? giving it shape, shaping it as we move on and create it. And then we told ourselves, why not? And that is why we created uh, this for Genexus, to feel your application so that you change with your, with your hands, as an artist would do. Genexus with iBeating allows your interaction fields that, are unthink that were unthinkable before. Now you can create something in Genexus and see it in your application immediately. And the best thing of all, you can change your application in your device. And those changes are incorporated in the Genexus model automatically. You can create better user experience with an agile, interactive, incre and incremental development as any true artist would do, feeling your application as you are making it. Genexus is there. You can dream as a child, work as an artist, create applications as a professional. Very good. Well, you can download uh, the the version. It's there. You can download it. Thank you, Gaston. One of the things I wanted to uh, do together with what uh, Gustavo Carriquiri was saying, I wanted to make a real test to this version, and I would like to give you some scenarios people are talking about and. Uh, uh, please tell me how it can behave or how this version can help us. Okay. Well, the first thing has to do uh, with platforms. You mentioned integration with Mercado Libre and RP and so on. But what happens if someone wants to do the other way around? I mean, somebody who has a product and wants that product to be a platform so that people integrate to that uh, product. Well, there are people who are walking along that road, and I think that we can do so. Um, I would like to invite Fernando Paniza from Bantotal and, and tell us what they're doing. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you. How are you doing? I was, I was quite doubtful about who Fernando Paniza was going to, go, to get up. I know three of them. I know one working in Android, another one Fan, Ban Total, and the other one in Sforza. I had questions for the three of you. Well, those are my clones. Well, it's not only software invading the world. It's Fernando Paniza's invading the world. All right, tell, tell me about Ban Total. Well, it's a system of critical missions that uh, caters for everything a financial institution does. Um, um, mobile banking, internet banking, traditional banking. It's a data generation. And uh, how are you doing? Well, we're doing fine. We are successful in what we do. And we are in 15 countries in Latin America. We've got over 50 customers. And we manage finance, loans, and uh, savings of over 20 million households. And tell me about platforms. Uh, uh, what's, uh, what are you thinking about? What changes are you thinking of? Well, I would like to join you in this 
question that you were mentioning about digital transformation. Um, we uh, uh, hear about new banking, digital banking, um, vintages, new competitors. So what the banking requires are, are, is ideas and innovation, but innovation has to be landed uh, to reality. And the largest challenge is that those innovators and uh, um, get close to the bank and those ideas connect to the bank's platform. And, and so uh, it's a suite of uh, APIs. It's a special, is it a special program? Uh, yes, we're going to have a, um, a talk about that, Van Total Developers. And we um, pro propose, we published an uh, API of Van Total. This means that if I've got an idea, for instance, for a banking issue, I can use Van Total as a platform. Right, exactly. Can you give me an idea, an example? All right, three examples. One is an indoor, um, doors in, I would say, for the bank. Um, we've got lots of data, but there is a lot of information with the digital networks. And so we have a C-Target app, which means um, it joins the, um, uh, the, the information of the bank and social networks and econometric models, where we put in some prediction models, what the user requires, and then we suggest it. The second one is a final user app for compulsive savings. Not say, not compulsive sales, no. It's a compulsive uh, savings. You remember that um, 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 jar where you would put your coins in when you were a child? All right, well, uh, a customer wants to buy something, and what he can do is to make micro savings, and we can transform it uh, or transport it to another account if you don't. So just by three clicks, you know, you're doing. And, and who, whose idea was that? Well, what's, what's, an, what, what's the name of the, of, the, of the app? It's called De A Poco. It comes from where? Where does it come from? It comes from Tales Lab. I was, he was asking me, he was asking me, and he didn't tell me the name. No, it did. OK, now, OK. All right, because otherwise Sylvia gets angry with me. Uh, there is a talk um, uh, by Thales Lab uh, on Tuesday morning, and uh, you're going to be hearing there everything that you need uh, for the road to success. And the third one, the most popular one, uh, we launched it two, two weeks ago. It's called Avivate, and it centralizes all benefits and discounts from banks. And Avivate ends up of being a communication channel, a sales channel from the bank to users. All right, L uh, let me put this into a clean copy. If I've got an idea, I don't have to go, I mean, I'm a startup, nobody knows me, I've got, I haven't got a company, I don't have to go to the bank. I enroll to bank total developer and you do it. Okay, I understand that, I see that's all right, you are helping developers. But uh, do you do this because you are good and generous and kind? Uh, well, digital transformation is to help our customers so that they get information firsthand in everything that has to do with the connection, reducing uh, the time of uh, the starting up. And what about technically speaking? How, how do you do that? Do you have a knowledge base? What you have? Well, okay, little by little, uh, Professor. 11.45 is our talk. You are invited. Everyone is invited. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. The other scenario that is everywhere and that I was very interested in, I've been working on it, is the Internet of Things. Well, the Internet of Things is, is quite broad in the scope. Although it seems quite simple, um, there are several um, things regarding architecture behind that. We've been working with a startup there of Talis Lab. Good, yes, you've mentioned it. Sylvia, take down note, I'm saying it. Well, tell it, it's a startup that um, focuses on, on an IT uh, architecture. You've got two extremes in broad lines. You've got a stream, an end, there where you have the sensors, gateways, and the network of sensors and the type of protocols used that are not necessarily um, from the internet. And uh, 
and then there are many startups around that how to set up that kind of thing and the communication and then the other end the other extreme which is very interesting lots of things to be done there and that's those data coming in how can you store them where and what to do with them how to visualize them what actions you can take what patterns can you detect and we've been working on it uh, on a knowledge base so that whoever wants to start or if you've got an, uh, a many project there you don't start in from scratch I mean uh, how do you set up the uh, network where's the gateway how can you classify what type of sensors I mean what's the size well um, there is a talk by Eugenio Garcia about this knowledge base uh, explaining about uh, the architecture around it very good and the last scenario where that's everywhere and it's got many names you know cognitive service ma machine learning uh, artificial intelligence and so on well once again um, this is uh, very large is a large trend large players big players are there um, artificial intelligence as a service and I think that that takes us to new user experience levels and that's tied up to uh, something that we've been working on. It's a scenario that we think is quite pertinent and uh, um, quite pertinent in terms of user experience. And those are called chat boxes. Uh, there, people from our team have been doing research. And I would like to get some support from someone who's been working on that. That's Sebastian Gomez. And he's been doing quite a lot of things. Sebastian Gomez, uh, Nicolas Gomez, thank you. I mean, the most elegant person from the team. Here, you've got it. Do you go to work every day like that? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah, he wears a tie every day to work. Well, can you, can you tell us something about chat boxes and what's the relation with... Okay, very well. Well, uh, different studies have uh, shown evidence that users spend most of their time, you know, when they are in their mobile um, devices in messaging um, the um, conversation interface is very attractive and this means that companies would like to adopt uh, that uh, conversational interface in their uh, messaging apps or in their own apps yes text image and so on people are used to that so what have you been doing then well we've been working on uh, a chat box for this event so that you know about the speakers uh, chart and, uh, um, and grid and so you know, uh, let me show it rather than tell you about it. Okay, tell us, tell us more about it. Okay, what you are seeing there, that's the messenger, uh, well the, the box is called Rudy and it's in Facebook you can find it uh, on facebook.com slash Rudy. It's this uh, green um, owl. Uh, why, why is it called Rudy? Well, I'll tell you perhaps afterwards. Well, it's going to be in the event app. Perhaps uh, you've got it. And uh, along this morning, you will be seeing it. Because this question of the conversational interface is going to happen in apps and also in, in other environment as just messenger and so on well as Nicolas was uh, testing me hard okay let's test uh, uh, Rudy widely the first thing you have to do is to say hello or something greet him yes what's happening behind all right what's happening is that Rudy is detecting the language thanks to a cognitive service of Watson and the intention of what I'm doing in this case is greeting so version 15, let me tell you, also has an SDK uh, from Watson with uh, work with the IBM cognitive people and everything related to Watson. And anyone who wants to start interacting, well, you'll see that this is available in version 15, uh, Watson SDK, SDK for GenXus. Yes, Marco and Sabrina are going to give a speech, a presentation tomorrow afternoon about this topic. So here he's telling you what he knows. Let him, let's see if he knows when your presentation will take place. So I'm going to ask, when is Sebastian is going to give his talk? 
Do you always have to ask uh, things in the same way? No, no, no. There is a cognitive service. And he tells me that he found a talk that will take place tomorrow in it ballroom and if he doesn't know what happens well he will tell me to ask in a different manner and maybe he sends me to the secretariat well if I go to secretariat then it's because Rudy cannot tell me well this is a very interesting thing afterwards you can test Rudy yourself and uh, you can test it if you wish okay and since we have artificial intelligence I would like to ask him one more question to reveal a mystery we had recently in Uruguay. Who is the dean in the f football team of Uruguay? Well, there is a spelling mistake. Depends on what's your team, he says. Which team you are following? Well, he's smart, right? That's the best answer. But, uh, you made a spelling mistake and when you were writing and still he was able to figure out the reply. Well, you're having a great time, right? But what is Rudy for? What's his purpose? Well, that's a very good question. In general, it's useful to solve anything that is to do with interaction of my users with the company by telephone, email or whatever. Whichever way my users get in touch with the company, this helps me because it's a conversational channel. The people from Casmo, for example, which is a medical mutual institution in Uruguay and some other enterprise, are seeing how this interface can help to answer frequent questions, for example, uh, which pharmacy has such and such a medication, etc. Well, thank you so much. Did you have a plan B? I certainly did. Very good, Gaston. Thank you very much. Anything else to tell me? One more thing. We have to introduce now Genexus M. As many of you know, uh, some time ago we carried out a new architecture of our platform with Genexus X, and now we believe that it's time to have a new evolution that we have called Genexus M. And to sum up, this is a re architecture that will allow us to work with RKB in any operational uh, system, Max, Linus, or Windows. I'm going to run it in my Mac. Native, without parallel. No, without virtual machine. Well, make a demo. No. I just have one image to show you because there is another level always, and it's uh, Guillermo and Herman who have been working on this these last times and on Wednesday are going to make their presentation after mine. I don't know what time it will be, but I think it's around 9.30. So they're going to present this new architecture and show it in more detail, and they will risk making a presentation with a demonstration. Well, this is a road that we've traveled before. We know very well how to execute certain things. Now we are doing the full cycle from the creation of the knowledge base to the production in the cloud. One thing, you edit in the max, but where do you generate it? In the cloud. And each one of the steps that we take are going to be milestones. When can I try it? Well, very soon. We are going to release it in about six months. That's what I was told by the experts. Well, now we thank Gaston. Thank you, Gaston. My friend, this is the end of the keynote. And I just wanted to summarize the things that seem more important to me and the reasons why we are here. So we have two tasks, to learn everything 
from the Genexus 15 about the Genexus 15 version, but hopefully uh, you will dedicate a lot of time these days to digital transformation and uh, see what we have to do and how to do it. The Genexus community has a very powerful tool and we have a lot of experience because we are already on the other side of digital transformation to help our clients, which is of the utmost important. So enjoy the event. Thank you very much.